Okay, welcome everyone uh, to WW, oh, sorry, WW, Dev World 2011. I wish it was WWDC. Um, my name's Neil Gladwin. I'm the a web systems developer at Queensland University of Technology. I wrote QT Mobile, which is QT's iPhone app. Um, and the reason I've done The Power of Delegates, which in hindsight is a terrible title, um, is because I learned in Java and did PHP um, and a few other uh, programming languages like C Sharp and so on. But delegates and protocols, which I'll be going into a bit as well, um, others, it's pretty unique to Objective-C. It's the thing I had most trouble com um, coming across to Objective-C. And I think it's the thing that if you, if you get used to it and know how to use it, you can really get some power from it. So what is this talk about? Um, first off, delegates, which the title sort of assumes. Um, defining protocols, singletons, which to some people, or maybe a lot of people, is a dirty word, and memory management in delegates as well. Um, the memory management is what I consider to be the advanced part of it. It took me about a year, including many conversations with Apple, to try and figure out what it's doing and why it's doing it. Um, but the rest of it will be intermediate level, so um, you should learn some things anyway. So, as I said before, it's pretty unique to Objective-C. There are things like uh, C-sharp and Java. In Java, I think it's called implementation. Um, and C-sharp does delegates as well. But due to Objective-C's uh, memory management and self-memory management, uh, you can utilize it a bit better and a bit differently. So when I was creating QT Mobile, we had the problem where the university was running a custom authentication system. Um, called ESOE. It's single sign-on, so you sign on once and basically you can get to any, um, any um, protected resource. But the thing was, it was web-based only. Um, it wasn't being further developed, so it was, you know, we couldn't change anything. And it has been ingrained in QUT, so we couldn't change the authentication process either. The other thing was, when I was creating QT Mobile, uh, yes, we had some uh, definition about what we wanted to do it to do, but I also wanted other students and staff members to be able to utilize the, the code in my application so that they can get to protected resources, write their own apps. And so far, uh, at least one other staff member and a few other students um, are wanting to do this with QT Mobile, so we will get there eventually. The problem with ESOE is it's a pretty complex system and it's going to be a pain in the neck for every person who comes along who wants to write an app to try and figure out the way that ESOE works um, and write the code for it. As a brief look at how ESOE works, basically you authenticate with uh, the ES ESOE server, you get back a cookie or a session, you send this, you, sorry, you attempt to get the request from the destination server. It sends back a, a request, SPAP request. You send this request cookie, uh, sorry, token with the ESOE cookie to the ESOE server. It sends back a response. Uh, this token is then sent with the cookie to a URL underneath um, the destination um, resource, basically. Uh, some protected resource slash SPAP slash SSO. That gets a cookie sent back, and then from then on, you can just send this cookie and uh, the data is returned. Typically, things like XML, JSON, um, and other uh, things, even including websites. Don't worry about too much about the complexity of this um, and remembering things. It's just to say how many to's and fro's, um, and a lot of failure areas, basically any point can fail, and you have to deal with that failure as well. So when I was writing it, I had to remove all this complex code uh, from 
other developers so that when they wanted to implement QT Mobile, all they had to do was uh, send a request and wait for a response or a failure. Also, in case of other unthought of areas, there's a few other optional things that um, they can interact with, but I'll get into that a bit later. So the first off, for first off, it I use a singleton. Now, a lot of people hate singletons, um, and there is a reason why a lot of people hate singletons. Often they're used as global storage areas for um, variables that should really just be an instance variable or um, a property for use, using setters and getters. Basically, other um, classes can grab the data out of those uh, variables. But if used correctly, you can be pretty good, pretty powerful and required as well. A singleton, for those who don't know, is it restricts the initialization of an instance to a uh, singular. So throughout the whole program's life cycle, only one instance can exist. Um, Apple's example of this is NS HTTP cookie storage. So there's only one storage area for these cookies. Yeah, there's multiple cookies with multiple URLs and data in it, but you shouldn't have multiple storage areas because then you don't know where things are being stored um, and you could create a dual authorization um, and cause some issues, which I'll get into in a bit. So how to define a singleton? Basically, in your header file, um, the big thing difference here is that plus symbol at the beginning basically just defines it as a static uh, method. Um, once you're inside the implementation file, uh, the instance of itself is a static variable as well. So once again, only one instance of it. At synchronized basically means that this code can only be run once at any point of time. Um, if two threads went to go to the connection, uh, the connection manager at the same time and hit this, well, you can't technically run it both at the same time, but it will lock this bit of code out until one thread's finished with it. Once that thread has, done, has finished with it, it'll come in here and then say, oh, this has already been done, so I'll get the return of the connection manager. This makes sure that you can't get more than one instance of the connection manager. So as I said before, why do this? It prevents real authorization of a protected resource. Say we did have multiple instances of a uh, connection manager. Now, first off, the, the number one connection manager goes out to get a protected resource. It authorizes with that protected resource. And then a second thread comes in and tries to authenticate with the same protected resource. That first initialization might be invalid now because the second one's been authenticated with it. It comes back and then goes, oh crap, I need to re-authenticate with this. I've, I've lost my, uh, my session. Go back and then there's a to and fro of two things trying to get the same instance. So you have to make sure that only one instance, one authorization of a protected resource can happen. Um, also, it's good for if you want to do a global um, pause, uh, halt in case your application uh, ends and you don't want to get resources back from this particular resource. Um, for example, if the user sends a home button and it's taking a while for the, um, the network to get back to you, uh, it might be good to do a global halt across it. And I'll go into that a bit later on as well. So going back to QT Mobile, the app that of uh, QT, when other students or staff members um, are wanting to get access to these particular protected resources, they don't know anything about ESOE. Basically, all they want to do is get the resource and do, do stuff with it. 
the calling class shouldn't have to do anything like um, deal with uh, the authorization of a server or um, uh, invalid usernames and passwords and so on. You have to, but you have to tell um, the user, the other programmer, what they have access to. And this goes into protocols, which I'll go into shortly. It also, in, to prevent reauthorization or other things that they shouldn't have access to, um, doing these protocols really helps to remove the user from things that they don't have access to, but only expose things that they, they need or may want to um, have access to. So what is a delegate? A delegate basically, instead of your class doing something, you delegate that task to someone else, someone that's better equipped to do it. It removes code that you don't need to know about. Um, so for example, a view controller who wants to display some data from an XML source doesn't need to know about the authentication of that source, doesn't need to know about failures in case of passwords or usernames or whatever. It just wants to get it and get a response from it. And if it fails, deal with it then. So how to define a delegate? It's really, really simple. Basically, in your header, it's a type ID because it's not a specific type. Um, connection delegate, which I'll get into in a bit, and then just delegate. It can be whatever you want to call it, and I will go into some other examples that don't call it delegate. At property, uh, non-atomic, does everyone know what non-atomic means? Does anyone not know what it means? Okay, cool. Um, if you don't say non-atomic, it assumes atomic, and I'm 95% sure that also it's meant for uh, threading purposes. That means that only one uh, thread can hit this variable at any one time and uh, grab out the data. It does take a little bit more code, so if you know that your object will never be called by another uh, by more than one third at a time, set non-atomic makes it a little bit quicker. But if it does get hit by two threads at a time, uh, bad things will happen. Can happen. So that line of code just here is a protocol. Uh, also, I say a sign because it's not following the typical retain release life cycle of, a, of most variables, so you just assign it. So that uh, bit of code there before is a protocol, the start of a protocol. Um, sometimes referred to in Java as interface, um, and it basically allows unrelated objects to communicate with each other and define how the communication, uh, what they can communicate with. Objective C allows both required and optional um, implementations. So basically, you must respond to this particular selector, and you may respond to this selector. I'll go through some exa examples of Apple's code that um, might make it a bit more obvious as to what I'm talking about with that. So how to define a protocol? First off, at the very top of your header, uh, at protocol, and typically the um, uh, standard is the class with delegate at the end. So connection manager delegate. Um, this is that singleton I was talking to you about. Now underneath, this is where you actually define the protocol. It is of type NS object. Uh, protocols can be protocols of other protocols. Um, sort of like inception, um, how deep does it go? But um, in, most, in this case, it's just in this object. So now I'm going to say what is required if you want to implement this protocol in your class, you have to respond to two um, methods, two selectors. Connection did fail, 
um, and connection did finish. Now, connection is an object which I'll show to you in a bit, um, but that is the object that's returned to the calling class um, in these particular instances. This is not necessarily this. I've also done a protocol for connection and its required response is also these. Um, so hence anything that implements connection manager delegate might not call connection but needs to respond to these particular methods. Underneath optional, um, so you may or may not, it's not going to cause any issues uh, if you don't respond to these selectors but uh, it's optional to do it. So that's the important bits there. Should have gone on to that slide. Oops. So as I said before, the required, you have to implement these, um, these methods, these selectors. It gives compiler warnings, so it's good feedback for the, the programmer to know, oh, these ones are missing, I need to implement these. Um, and the optional won't give any warnings, but um, it's good to know when you go into the header, you can say, oh, I've got these required um, selectors and these uh, optional ones that I may or may not want to deal with. So how do you call this or implement this? This particular one, I'm using the, uh, the required uh, selector, and it's a connection delegate. So basically, you check if the call, if the delegates, if the delegate can respond to the selector, connection did fail. If it can, you send a, a reference to yourself to the delegate. Now. This stores the delegate, a reference to the calling class, and that's what this is. So it's sending basically the owner uh, to the method connection did fail and sending a reference of itself to it. From there, I'll go into what you can do with it. Um, so basically, this is what you would see in the calling classes method. Connection did finish the connection, and you can do whatever you want in there. And you have the same ability to get access to properties and uh, methods as you would um, in any other case of uh, allocation and um, initialization. So um, if, this, if this class had a property called um, data, you could just go the connection dot data and um, that would re return the data in that particular class. I'll go on to a demo. Is anyone completely lost yet? Okay, either that or you're not telling. Um, so here is the connection manager, the singleton. I've defined it as a uh, the static instance of it. Um, and I've defined the protocol here. It's a type NS object. There's additional optional things down here, but it defines it as a connection manager uh, delegate, the protocol. So now this stores a reference of the delegate, so it can respond to, um, to the delegate. And this one's a little bit different. In most cases, and I'll show you in a bit, um, and you've used delegates before if you've ever used a table view or um, a connection, NSUL connection. A lot of things use it, but you might not be aware of what's happening. Typically, you initialize it, and then you set the delegate to it. I've <coughs> sent the delegate in the initialization of it, and I'll explain why in a bit. So in the initialization, 
uh, you set self.delegate to the delegate that gets sent in initialization. And then you can respond to it. Uh, I think I've got it further down. So in the case of a failure, it determines, does the delegate respond to the selector connection did fail? If it does, send the, a message self.delegate uh, to connection did fail with a reference to yourself. Now, I'll show you where um, Apple uses it and you'll sit, start to see uh, the similarities. In UI table view, this is the header file for it, quite large. <laughs> so we have two protocols. We have the data source and the table view delegate. So when you set these particular ones, you initialize UI table view, alloc it with frame, and then you set the data source and the delegate. Um, the data source and the delegate don't have to be the same class. Typically, it's good to uh, separate what the data that you have versus the UI that you have. Uh, it's called uh, MVC, I think it's called, Model View Control. So underneath here, we have optional um, methods that we uh, can respond to. Uh, we'll display cell. Some of these you might have seen before. Some of them you haven't. We've also got the required ones, and you've definitely seen these because if you've done UI uh, table view data source, you would have had to implement these. Number of rows in section and uh, cell for row at index path and number of sections in table. Uh, no, only two. Um, then there's optional ones, number of sections in table view. If I try and implement this, and you, you say that I'm going to um, abide by this protocol in the header file, basically at the end, you just put uh, greater than, sorry, less than, uh, UI table, view data source and delegate. I'm going to, oh no, I'll do these ones. And you can do multiple, of course. Now, if I, if I compile that, it gives me a few warnings saying incomplete implementation of the, data, of the protocol. Uh, it would be a data source. So basically, it's saying that Those two required methods aren't found here. Table view, self row at index path, and number of rows in section. So if I go back to these, and add these required ones, I meant to return things, but uh, basically it doesn't say that it's an incorrect implementation of it. Um, I've abided by the protocol of having these two required methods, and I'm responding to them. Might go back to a demo in a bit. So in this particular case, the connection manager, the singleton, is responsible for the authenticating and managing the resources. 
requesting classes, basically, if you require authenticated um, data, this only responds to the success and failure of that request. Authentication may fail um, or expire at any time, um, and it's not the requesting class's problem to deal with that. So once again, as I said, password fails. Uh, the requesting class is going to spend all your time implementing this thing over and over again. And yeah, you can call it different ways, but um, you really have to put it onto a delegate. Get someone else to do it for you, and that's a definition of a delegate. So, Quite often, and this is when I, uh, this is why I'm talking about this particular thing, uh, delegates. I've never seen anyone implement more than one delegate, and it's typically only for one thing, and they don't often check to see if the calling class, sorry, the delegate can respond to that selector. Basically, and the best example is for push modal view controller, I think it is. Some people just say dismiss modal view controller um, on the class that is presented. Yes, this dismisses, but it shouldn't be the, the task of the presented view to dismiss itself. It should be the thing that's presenting it. So you send a um, call to the owner of it to say, dismiss me, and it dismisses. UI table view uses two delegates, and it works quite well. The reason is because the data source might not be the same thing that is doing the view of the table view. So this part is where PowerPoint is going to fail if I try to do it in that. So the class requesting the authenticated resource creates a object for the protected resource <coughs> attributes. Things like the URL destination, the cookie variable, um, not necessarily always the same thing. Um, a reference to itself, um, saying I want to uh, get called when you're done, and a few other things. This gets sent to the connection manager, and the connection manager goes through and, and pulls out the details of it. Now, it can be smart and say, oh, I've already got a session with this particular um, server, or it can be dumb and just try and do it anyway. So it attempts to do an NSU URL connection, which for those who don't know is just to get a requested resource. It's a network resource. Um, I think it can also do files as well uh, on the local machine, but um, it is a threaded operation as well. So it attempts to do this. Now, at this point, it may succeed, because it might not be authenticated um, uh, resource. It might already be authenticated with it. And therefore, it should respond to the class requesting the, the, the resource. Um, if it fails, it should respond to the connection manager to say, I'm not working, please deal with this. You could go through the connection manager for everything, but then you have to know what access to the data you want. So if you want to get the data out of it or know it redirects or there's a cookie involved with it, to send it to this and then to copy all that data off that you might or may, may or may not need and then to send it to this, um, is a bit stupid. It should respond to the thing that actually calls it if, if it succeeds. So say it does fail, the connection manager then authenticates with the server um, using the attributes from the protected resource uh, object. Now, once again, this might, might fail. Um, the network could be down, um, incorrect username and password. Oh, that probably wouldn't be that one, but if the network's down, just for example, it will respond to the requesting authenticated resource to say, nada, it didn't work. Tell your user to bring up a little pop-up and say it's not working and try again later. If it does work, it should respond back to the connection manager and say, I worked. Here's my... Um, the object that you wanted to get to, you deal with it now. From then, 
It can then go try and do an NSURL connection, and if it succeeds, it goes back to the requesting class. If not, it reiterates and goes back to the authenticated server, to authenticate with the server. Now, some people may or may not be aware, but there's a problem with doing this. You've created an object that you've allocated somewhere in memory, but you're sending ownership to someone else. So who's going to release the memory? Are you going to send a message back to the connection manager to release the object that you may or may not be 100% sure what it is? Um, sorry, that the connection manager may not be sure what it is, um, and it's extra code. How, how are you going to prevent uh, leaking or, or over-releasing? Um, if you send it back to the connection manager and it copies one thing and then releases it, you may have wanted something else and you're trying, get, trying to get data out of something that's been released and it's going to crash the app, obviously. Um, which is that one. Now, this is the part which um, I've uh, asked many Apple employees, I think about nine. Um, it was only the second last one that actually thought he might have an answer, but um, yeah. Does anyone get freaked out by this? You're avoiding return of an allocated object. Has anyone seen this? Nope. Okay. Um, it's not typical, and things like the Clang Static Analyzer is gonna, gonna throw up its arms and say, what are you doing, you idiot? This was actually Apple's code back in, I think it was like 2003 demo code for a Mac application, and it got my, uh, I was scratching my head for ages trying to figure out what it's doing, how this doesn't leak memory, and after I figured it out, I ran the code 100 times to see if it did leak, and it doesn't leak, as long as you deal with it correctly, and I'll show you how to do it. So with all memory allocating and releasing, you should release the memory at the end of the journey. So in the example of the network, you go to a protected resource, you try and get it, sorry, you allocate the memory, you try and get the protected resource, you may auth with the server, something might happen, you do something else, you come back, and you get the data back, or you fail. That's when you should release the memory. Um, if you're not covering all possibilities, if there's other options to get out of this particular cycle and you're not releasing the memory at the end of that journey, you're going to leak memory anyway. Um, and you can't, you, well, you can over-release memory, but it's going to cause a crash. So how do you access the voided return? And by voided return, I mean you're allocating a, an object and in the initialization, you are meant to send a, uh, self back with it, but instead of retaining that, you just void it off. It's gone technically into the abyss. Um, this was one of the protocols um, methods that it, the calling class had to respond to um, in another uh, example I had. It sends the connection basically a reference to itself the received data, um, it's an instance variable. Basically, the connection dot, and that's a property within this object, and you copy this data across because you're just about to release it. Once you release it, it calls dialloc in that class, everything's released, and it's all hunky-dory. Um, guaranteed no memory releases. And if you do this for connection did finish and connection did fail, which are technically the two parts, the two journey ends, it won't um, leak any memory. So what happens with ARC? Does anyone know what ARC is, or does anyone not know what ARC is? Okay. ARC uh, is sort of part of the NDA, but um, ARC is iOS, Objective C's, um, new way of dealing with memory. Basically, it's handled more by the compiler. I don't believe it's at runtime. Um, but basically, you don't have to release uh, memory or retain. It will do it all for you. The problem is, it's all done in the 
as far as I'm aware, the compiler, and it's intelligent to say, oh, you should retain this, so I'm going to retain it for you. Uh, you need to release it here. But this example doesn't follow the typical retain release cycle. So how do you deal with this? You create an, an instance variable of type self, and in the initialization method, set the IVAR to self. Once you're done with this particular object, i.e. once it gets sent back with the select and saying, you know, I'm done, um, you call a method in that object that says, uh, that sets the IVAR to, to nil. Arc will then say, uh, I've got no retain, I, ha I can release this object, DL it gets called and it's gotten rid of. The code for this, so in the header, uh, this is the class connection. It's of type connection and just an instance variable. And I've also um, uh, defined release connection as well in the header. In the implementation file, you set the, uh, the object, the connection, which is of type itself, to self, that retains itself. Very, very odd. And then when you want to release it, you set the connection to nil. So basically say, this instance variable that's keeping this memory around, there's, it nil it out, and then Arc will release that memory. Does anyone, anyone not get that? Okay, cool. So you've allocated some memory and you've voided the return and it's set off on its journey and you're not aware of a reference, or you don't have a reference back to that object. So how do you, how do you stop that object from uh, connecting or you want to hold all connections. When you get to a complex part of the, of the code, you can send back a message to the delegate to say, I'm about to do something very complex or takes a while, i.e. in the net, uh, on the network, and it can send itself, you store that in an array, and then that array expands and contracts depending on any objects that are taking a while to, to do something. You then want to halt it, you call halt, it goes through the array and sends a message saying, you know, stop, stop what you're doing and release yourself. Um, because in that array, you're just having pointers. Does everyone know what a pointer is? Sweet. Um, you, you just got a pointer to that object. But you, you have control, you have all the methods, all the uh, properties that you would normally have. So you can go through those things. Now, this is not the only way. I'm sure there's, whoop, there's many other ways to deal with it. The reason I did it this way was because I didn't want students and staff to have to deal with ESOE. Um, when a student wants to get a protected resource, they just go, Connection manager, get me this resource, that's it. They're all they're going to get responses if it passes or if it fails. And if it passes, they get the data. So it's really good for that. Um, low overhead, and it, the data is not copied to and fro. So, yes, everything can go back to the connection manager, and you can keep references uh, around uh, to these particular objects. But the thing is, it's going to respond to it, and you have to copy data out of it or send it back to the calling method, and you're doubling up then. It's going from the, um, the network resource to the connection manager back to the calling class, and it should have just gone to the requesting class. So that's it. I hope... All I wanted to get from this, like, this is a very, very particular instance. Um, you pretty much got next to no chance of coming across this problem in your own work. But I wanted to, and I'll, once again, this presentation will be up there. I wanted to show you protocols, delegates, um, singletons, and having that complex memory management so that uh, to think about how you can do your stuff a bit better 
Maybe. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, we'll have to implement authentication at each of the universities, and where do you want to go to and open up the biographical authentication method where you can? Um, the... No, as ESUE was made by some dude completely from scratch. Um, it adds on top of LDAP, I do believe, um, but 95% of it is completely custom. Um, as soon as he made it, the guy ran and um, he contracts himself back to the, uh, the university at an exorbitant rate, so um, <laughs> kudos to him. But yeah, uh, no, it's, but you'll still be able to use the same uh, uh, processes here that it would be to um, authenticate with anything else. Um, EOSUE is purely, actually, I'll just quickly show you the sign in process. So I've gone to a authenticated resource, uh, a protected resource, and you see this um, page, and it's got a self-submitting form down here that has a token in it. You verify the identity, and first off, you've got to sign in. So. So now I've uh, verified my um, existence with ESOE. Now it gets another token and says it's another uh, self-submitting form via JavaScript. I've turned off JavaScript, so it's not submitting anymore. And uh, oh, sure, I'll show you there. Here we go. This is the value from it. It's some crazy token with many attributes in it. It's base64 encoded and um, it's got some weird stuff inside it. You establish session and this can only, I'm probably going to get failed. Oh no. It only has a life cycle of about 30 seconds. So if you don't get back to it soon enough, it, it kills that session off and you have to start it again. So now that I've verified my session, I can then get the, to the um, authenticated resource. Um, so to answer your question, no, it's completely custom as far as I'm aware. I don't know too much about those particular authentication systems. I just noticed it is using a simple encoding, so it's not really... I don't know if you just got that name from somewhere else. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looks similar to a simple Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know too much about it other than the front end and what's sort of happening in the user experience journey. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to talk to you a bit more about it offline um, if you want to get some more details about it. Are you thinking of making your own uh, university app? Yeah. Is it, uh, is it web based only? I don't know too much about the... You mean the app? Uh, no, the um, authentication. Authentication, yeah. Yeah. So you're going to have to do something similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? No. All right. Um, any questions about QUT Mobile in general, um, the iPhone app? Um, one of the things that someone's asked me a lot about is uh, QUT's Mobile's use of the map data. Um, MapKit allowed in iOS 4 um, putting your own overlays on top of it. Um, so what we did was we had the same XML data source feed a web-based map view. Um, so it can show buildings and extra annotations and stuff like that. And then the QT Mobile can um, grab that same data, 
and do overlays and um, other annotations and so on. Uh, the map kit thing's pretty good. You should be able to get there. The biggest issue I had, and um, this is why I'm talking about it, is in iOS 4 at least, I don't know if they fixed it in iOS 5, but you cannot handle any more than about one or two overlays. Um, this particular one had about 800 points and about 100 overlays. And if you implement it the way that Apple tells you to implement it, it will crash. It goes up to about a gig kind of swap file and about 400 megs memory and then just goes, nah, nah. What you have to do is basically go through all the layers and if you search around on the Apple secure forums long enough, you'll find a little bit of code and the Apple dude that says, yeah, there's a problem with this and uh, here's a code to try and fix it and yeah, we may fix it sometime in the long future, distant future. But basically, you go through all the um, MK polygon view, I think it is, and you basically flatten it down to one. Once you get that one polygon view, you've still got all the detail in it, but it's just not layered anymore. It's one big flat over, uh, overlay. You can then place it on your map and you take what would have been about 400 mega memory down to around about 10 mega memory. Very strange the way that Apple did it. I don't. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. Did you find the same pain? Yeah. How long did it take you to fix it? Uh, well, the other chap that we worked on from QNAP sorted that out. I was working on Android at the time. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, I uh, managed, I came across a problem in beta days and I was tearing my hair out for ages and, yeah. What was really funny was the day that we were actually going to release the overlays, Google updated the maps that actually had all the overlay, the building overlays first. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the way we, we run it off our own server, the overlays, like the data points and everything like that, but um, for ease of um, sorting and so on, basically we get the XML data, put it into an SQLite database, and then we can pull it out uh, using more um, sorting techniques to increase the speed of it and so on. So, yeah, a little bit of information there. Any questions? No. Cool. Oh, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about it, email me. Um, that's my email address there. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of DevWorld. Thanks. Hey.